Hello, BookTube. Shall we go through the new Entertainment Weekly together and see what we find? <laughs> you all seem to enjoy that. I certainly enjoy doing it with you. Uh, and it's based on my contention, I, I've said it many times here, that uh, that although Entertainment Weekly is all about pop culture, it's about you know music and the latest internet memes the kids like so much, and all kinds of television drama, cable drama, movie drama, although it's all about that and always has been about celebrity culture, I have found over the years that it is saturated with books, more so with every with every passing year, uh, as book properties suddenly become more and more uh, lucratively produced. It's just, it's amazing to me. They run up a, a, a real close hard second to superhero properties in terms of virtual surefire things, and I love that. It's all over the place, and uh, the meeting that you will get, according to... Uh, uh, a friend of mine who works in Hollywood and has worked in Hollywood forever, the uh, the meeting that you're likely to get is one in which you try to pitch an adaptation of some book, something or other, even especially if it's unconventional. Uh, and I I have a, a suspicion that this issue will be no different because look what's on the cover. This is this is about the final season of uh, HBO's Game of Thrones, which is an adaptation of a book series. And, and an awkward one at that, because uh, the the book series by George R. R. Martin was supposed to be finished long by four now. So that I don't think I don't think David Benioff ever thought that he was going to be adapting free what freestyling. I thought he was he I I'm pretty sure he thought he would be adapting a book. And uh, the final book of George R. R. Martin's Game of Thrones will never be written by George R. R. Martin. We will never see it. It might be written from his notes by Brandon Sanderson or somebody else, but it won't be, he's not going to write about Westeros anymore. Uh, which means that, that this will be the only real conclusion that the book gets. It's certainly, certainly fans of the show will get a conclusion to the story long before it ever appears in print, which is kind of amazing. Uh, well, let's see, if we work our way through here uh, and see uh, how far, like for instance, we get to the must list, the must list is how they start off every issue, all the stuff that's headlining for them. And the very first thing that comes up is a, a worshipful profile of Lucas Hedges, the star of Boy Erased, which is based on a novel, or a memoir. It's based on Jared Conley's novel, or memoir, <laughs> about going to gay conversion camp uh, and the, all the weird stressors that go on there. So that's a, that's a book right off the bat. Uh, and then we have uh, also on the must list is Legacies which is yet another spin-off of The Vampire Diaries, which, of course, started as a book, started as a series. Somebody had to have pitched that, what, what is that, 10 years ago? Pitched The Vampire Diaries and said, look, I, I think this will work. Somebody had to have made that pitch based on the book. Uh, there's also a mention of the uh, the Stranger Things World Turned Upside Down book uh, that is, I, I, I had a copy here briefly. It, it was It looks fake distressed. It looks like an old collectible book. And, it, and, of course, this being the 21st century when every single person wants to sue every other single person, there's a little disclaimer on it saying, warning, this book is intended to look distressed. <laughs> oh, my. Uh, okay, for in on the must list for books is Nine Perfect Strangers by Leanne Moriarty. Uh, didn't do anything for me, but it's great to have a book so far up front in the issue. Uh, what have we got here? Okay, all right. There's an article on uh, on Megyn Kelly's ouster uh, from the Today Show for out for aggrievedly wondering what's so bad about white people dressing on in blackface for Halloween. She was uh, rather unceremoniously given the boot uh, in a in a news story that actually gave me a tiny glimmer of hope for the human species in the 21st century, that glimmer was almost immediately extinguished. But for a moment, I felt it, uh, that that this person could be dismissed instead of being forced to mumble some sort of fake apology and then just go on the way she was. Although, uh, I don't know, I don't know, the article, the article is by Lynette Rice, and I don't know if Lynette Rice will mention in the article that uh, Megyn Kelly's ratings were also terrible. And that her, if her rate hasn't been great, she might have been kept on board and made to, to burble some sort of obviously fake apology, and that would be the end of it. I mean, it, it's not it's not that, that uh, networks are suddenly uh, conscientious about things like that. I mean, Laura Ingram has a show 
and and she made a Nazi salute on national TV at the Republican National Convention. If you can do that and keep your job, then it really it might all be about ratings. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> all right. Uh, the next piece is a rather rather in. Uh, lamentable title, Gay Time TV, <laughs> all about the, the current crop of of gay characters on TV. Uh, okay. Oh, all right. But here is the big... Oh, you've got original artwork here, too. Here is the big, uh, the big story on the end of Game of Thrones, uh, which, which stars uh, as Jon Snow, six-pack-a-day tobacco addict Kit Harington, uh, who may live to make another show. You never know. I am sure, I am 100% sure that he has some form of cancer right now, as we speak, even as a young man. But it, it may not manifest for a while. Uh, he doesn't do anything except smoke. He doesn't eat. He doesn't drink. He doesn't, he, doesn't, he doesn't have any biological sustaining mechanism other than this addictive chemical that, that is sold to him. Uh, so I, who knows how long that will work. It's kept Keith Richards alive forever. Uh, so this is a huge article. Oh, good lord! A huge article on that. All right. Uh, oh, then we get then we get this thing: the front runner, uh, starring Hugh Jackman as uh, 1980s U.S. presidential candidate Gary Hart. A lot of you will be too young to remember Gary Hart. I was writing about politics when Gary Hart was running for president, and when it looked like he would be president. Uh, I remember the whole situation, and I have I have watched the screener for this movie, and I've read a bit about it, and I'm baffled at the angle that that, that the producers here, the showrunners of this movie, are taking. I'm just baffled, attempting in any way, even briefly, even tangentially, in order to make a larger point about voyeuristic modern culture, attempting in any way to make Gary Hart a victim or the hero of his own story is flatly absurd. Just flatly absurd. This is a man who was carrying on an extramarital affair even after he knew that the press had got wind of it and was starting to nose around. Okay, if you're a raving egomaniac, which you almost certainly are if you think you can run for president, uh, then in a circumstance like that, uh, normal people, not not any of the, the, the weird Tim Burton characters that are around the country now, but normal people, a normal person would say, okay, well, uh, even if I don't stop this extramarital affair, I'm certainly going to stop pursuing it now. I'm going to keep my eye on the ball. I'm going to keep my eye on the priority of becoming president, and then I can resume it later. But I'm going, now that I know that, that I, there's a, a tremor on the ground here, and I'm thinking that someone might be watching what I'm doing, then I will certainly stop. And he didn't. And when it was brought to his attention, he told the press on camera, it looked straight into the camera, and lied. Said, I'm not having any kind of an affair. Go ahead and put a tail on me. You won't find anything. It'll be very boring. I remember when that news broke, when that particular story broke. I remember I was in a newsroom at the time, and I thought, that's the exact wrong thing to tell to reporters if you're still carrying on any kind of an affair. So you mustn't be. My, my thought, naive as it was, was, okay, well, the only reason that you would tell the press to follow you around would be if you have, in fact, stopped your extramarital affair and there's nothing for them to see. And he hadn't. <laughs> he hadn't. He was caught. His campaign ended. It was all torpedoed. There was no President Hart. It was all his fault. Not just for being unfaithful to his wife and breaking the vows that he made on an altar in front of a church full of people, but also in lying straight to the camera about whether or not he was doing that. So he wasn't a victim in any way, and nor was he a bellwether or a harbinger of our current 24-hour-a-day breaking news cycle. Not at all. The 24-hour-a-day addictive breaking news cycle where something dramatic has to happen in the news every day, and there are ongoing stories, and there are people whose narratives rise and fall, you can tell just from that description where it comes from. It comes from the same place where the United States got its current president. Reality TV is the problem, which didn't exist in Gary Hart's day, and which was cynically and knowingly foisted on the American people. It was knowingly foisted on them, this product that intentionally blurred the line between what was real and what was fake. MTV's pioneering show, the, the, the stars of that show were told, here's your script. And some of them actually said, wait, I thought this was reality. I thought you were just going to film us. And they were just laughed at. And it got worse from there. And America became addicted to that. I remember when it was happening. I remember when those shows were edging out all the crafted 
hour-long dramas that had been the dominant form of entertainment on TV for, you know, 30 or 40 years. I remember when that was happening, and I remember thinking and saying, while drunk, late at night, to trapped house guests, that if, if people aren't careful, we're going to raise up a whole uh, demographic group that doesn't know the difference between the two. And if that happens, the thing that I said at the time, oh God, how I wish I had been right, the thing I said at the time was that if that happens, we might get Oprah Winfrey as president. <laughs> anyway, uh, this is a long article about uh, the front runner, uh, about Gary Hart. Okay, fine. And then we have, uh, they do a fall stage preview of uh, the stuff that's coming to Broadway, That, like, for instance, Brian Cranston is doing a, a Broadway version of network the old the old movie network which a lot of you will be too young to remember although you you may be familiar with its uh, immortal signature anthem where, where an absolutely stressed out anchorman goes on a rant on live tv and ends by saying i'm as mad as hell and i'm not gonna take it anymore <laughs> he tells his audience get up get up from where you're sitting get up from your living rooms go to your window raise it up and yell as loud as you can i'm as mad as hell and i'm not gonna take it anymore <laughs> I can't quite picture anyone else doing that. I can't quite picture Brian Cranston doing that. I'll have to see. Uh, but what else? What else have we got coming to to uh, Hollywood to Broadway? I bet. I bet there are book. There's book related stuff. Uh, and there is. There is. Aaron Sorkin is doing a version of To Kill a Mockingbird, <sighs> starring Jeff Daniels as Atticus Finch. Uh, it's it's a stage version. Of To Kill a Mockingbird, it's the it's a huge shoes to fill. It's it's Gregory Peck's signature role, and uh, that's based on a book. <laughs> oh yes, of course. All oh, right, of course. There is also the gigantic model King Kong. <laughs> there is also going to be a stage version of King Kong, which, as we saw recently on this channel, was kind of sort of based on a book. <laughs> uh, oh, there's also a revival of uh, Torch Song trilogy, Harvey Firestein's Torch Song trilogy. Um, which is literary. Uh, but anyway, let me move on to, uh, to movies. Let's see what we have from, oh God. Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> All right. Leah Greenblatt, who we see often in the book section, reviews Bohemian Rhapsody. Uh, uh, the Freddie Mercury, the Queen story. Uh, which stars, uh, seven pack a day tobacco addict Rami Malek from Mr. Robot. Uh, needs needs oxygen to get from scene to scene cannot go uh, cannot even walk up a few steps he needs inclines like he was on a wheelchair or something uh and he plays freddie mercury i saw i have a screener for it i watched the screener and honestly did not know what i was seeing i honestly did not know i, I you would swear uh when you're watching the movie bohemian rhapsody you would swear that you're watching a movie about the rise of the backstreet boys Yes, the, the, the movie is punctuated by the unbelievable genius of Queen songs. Queen songs are irresistible. Anybody who's ever seen uh, A Knight's Tale will know that. <laughs> uh, but that can only take you so far. If this is supposed to be a story about Freddie Mercury, which I gather from its, its outline and its plot structure that it is, then it's a complete failure. I'm sure it'll do well in the box office, but it's a complete failure. <laughs> it's, it's not the story of Queen. It's not the story of Freddie Mercury. It's the story of a saint called Freddie Mercury. I don't think... I only watched the screener once. I might watch it again. Uh, but I don't think that the movie even once explicitly says that Freddie Mercury was gay. <laughs> and it certainly doesn't have him betting bellhops, which he did with a reg with uh, with clockwork regularity. It doesn't have anything like that. It doesn't have anything like that, and because it doesn't have that kind of uh, just, in real life, he had this kind of pantherish self-confidence. Uh, Preapism. Uh, he was sexually just insatiable and omnivorous. And if you don't have that then you don't, you can't convincingly portray the way Mercury electric, electrified that private quality into what you got on stage. You won't be able to do it. They are, they were two sides of the same coin. If you take one out, then what you're left with on stage is vamping, which is, oh, it's not what Mercury did. He was on a different plane of existence 
when he was oh, anyway <laughs> anyway uh, I was not I was not overly pleased uh, with Bohemian Rhapsody so one of one of the other movies that they're doing uh, just maybe we'll do oh okay well they, they have a little mention here no review that's kind of strange no review but a little mention of uh, Christian Bale in Vice Christian Bale portrays Dick Cheney just transformed himself adds 50 pounds to his frame uh, just transforms himself ab absorbs Cheney's mannerisms and gives us an incredible performance Vice is an amazingly enjoyable movie <laughs> uh, oh and then uh, uh, let's see what else have we got here that Nutcracker movie that's coming out uh, we have okay we have a review by Chris Nashawati of uh, Boy Erased it gets a B uh, still haven't got to the books yet, of course, but the, those of you who know, those of you who've been through this with me before, you know that we have to go all the way to the back, <laughs> back to the loading dock where, where, uh, the, the part-timers, the new part-time high school students are scoring cheap drugs from the back of a car. That's, it's back where the rats are, the, the, the books are, the books, the, the magazine might be saturated with bookish content, but actual book reviews, <laughs> no, 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 you nerds can go all the way to the back. Uh, so what have we got? Uh, okay, so then for TV, we have a few TV things that I don't recognize. Uh, and then the what to watch section is all stuff. Good Lord, watch it, binge it. But it's all uh, it's all stuff I don't recognize. Uh, and th and that's just going to get worse because we're going to get some music and music. Steve doesn't know at all. Yeah, here's the music. Oh yeah, well, Amy Lennox, I know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. She, uh, I don't know why she's in music news. I hope it's not because she's dead. <laughs> but, uh, but all right, now we get to books. Uh, so the very first thing is a big thing. Uh, Jonathan Latham's new book, The Feral Detective, uh, which I hated. I thought it was just uh, just silly, just ridiculous garbage. Uh, let's see who who are we dealing with. Really, a green bat again. Uh, she's the one who reviews it. She gives it a solid B. Uh, and. What does she say about it? Uh, Latham is in his element writing about this far out west, uh, ruthless, sun-baked badlands culled from the strange brain confetti of Hunter S. Thompson, Thomas Pynchon, and Don DeLillo, especially Pynchon, especially Inherent Vice. Uh, hmm. Okay, well, she gives it a B. I wouldn't have given it that. It's, it's also... Uh, the main character goes on her zany life quest because Donald Trump wins the presidential election in 2016. So, although it's not the first contemporary novel to mention or deal in some way or other with Trump's uh, electoral college victory, uh, this may have the weird distinction of being the very first Trump derangement syndrome novel. I hate that phrase. Uh, alt rights, alt right people, and the, and uh, the and people who just want to uh, own the libs use it all the time. Uh, and they use it sloppily it, as just anybody who dislikes Donald Trump, anybody who has any criticism of him now in 2018, two years after he was elected, if you have any criticism of him, you must have Trump derangement syndrome. I can't stand that. He's become more of a danger and a disgrace to this country in the last two years, virtually month by month, than he was at the beginning when it was possible, even for those of us who've hated him for decades, to give him the benefit of the doubt. Remember talk of a pivot? It was possible in 2016 to do that. And it became less and less possible. I am not some triggered snowflake. It's 2018, and I hate what has happened here in this country. I also hate that the news, that news organizations are abetting this guy by, at, at the very uh, most, uh, shallowly making the economic news. The, the economy, of course, is the thing that anybody, nobody's involved, nobody cares, everybody's, uh, the, uh, Trump and his minions and his spokespeople are only talking about his racism and encouraging it. That's the only thing that anybody is talking about. But every once in a while on some news channel or cable news or whatever, you'll have some talking head who will say, well, you know, the economy is better than it's been in our lifetimes. Wages are up across the spectrum, not just for the wealthiest. Unemployment is down, sometimes to historic low levels. And that is really great news. It's a shame that the Republicans aren't, you know, campaigning on that without a single critical note mentioned. 
that that all of that is fake. <laughs> the, the, the deficit is ballooning every day by trillions of dollars. All of those economic good forecasters are fake. They are good for the short run. And we know how this story ends. We've been down this road before. This is not helping deregulizing, de deregulating the economy, cutting all sorts of safeguards for consumers, gutting union protections, and giving balloon-sized bonuses to people in upper management, of course, is going to give the economy a shot in the arm. But it's short-term, and it doesn't come without a price. And, and people don't even mention that. They say, well, you know, this president's done a lot of deplorable things. Certainly, I'll say he's done deplorable things, but then there's the economy. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Uh, but anyway, uh, some people do have uh, Trump derangement syndrome. Some people simply cannot deal as the kids put it, <laughs> and haven't been able to since he became president. They simply cannot deal. Uh, and that the main character in this book, if you bet you thought I'd forgotten the books, didn't you? The main character in this book is one of those people. And it's hard to take her adventures seriously. I mean, they're poorly written, and they're poorly paced, and the dialogue, oh my god, don't get me started about Latham's dialogue this time around. I loved it in some books, but oh my god. It's hard to pay any attention to any of that. If the genesis of all of it is that this person didn't like who won the presidential election in the freest and wealthiest and most powerful country in the world, uh, when when the the character herself is not inconvenienced by it. <laughs> anyway, anyway, let's let's just move on here. What else have we got for books? Uh, okay, David Canfield reviews Family Trust by Kathy Wang, uh, which is about a family. Oh, let me let me read your description here. Catalyzed by the cancer diagnosis of patriarch Stanley Wang. Family Trust navigates a Silicon Valley ravaged by greed, gentrification, and cultural transformation. Wang, a business school, a Harvard Business School graduate, knows the milieu well, its rhythms, its competition. She brings it alive with chapters that alternate between the Huangs. Daughter Kate, supporting a family of four as her husband works on his startup. Uh, son Fred, a Harvard MBA still stuck in the six-figure salary range. <laughs> uh, and Mom Linda starting to date in her senior years, having divorced Stanley long ago. Yeah, that's that's the plot of... Uh, I wonder if you can see the cover. That is the author, and that is... Family Trust is the name of the book. They make, I don't know why they make the cover so small, in, in, in preference for giving you the huge picture of the author. What I'm sure that the, uh, that the authors of these books would prefer it if... Uh, I mean, why is it that she gets the gigantic author photo and her book which is what she wants people to remember from this piece, is so small, when Jonathan Latham gets the exact opposite. His book is huge and he's small. I can't help but think that some of it might be diversity virtue signaling. But either way, I'm sure the author would like the, the cover of her book to be nice and big. Uh, but I, I read her book and I thought it was uh, plotting, mostly. Uh, the character of Linda, the, advan the adventurous mother who's, who goes into the dating world, uh, after a lifetime of not knowing anything about it, those chapters were wonderful, and they read like they didn't belong in the novel. They read like they belonged in some other kind of novel, in some much better novel. I would have preferred reading Linda's story from start to finish. Her children and their spouses are insufferably shallow and vapid people. They're made that way by their author, and I think she thinks that's more entertaining to read than it really is. Uh, but uh, well, let's see what the verdict is. What verdict does David Canfield give the book? He gives it a solid B. Uh, but Family Trust gets only so much out of the minutia. It occasionally plods. Oh, I thought more than occasionally, but that's all right. This guy's... Uh, I've learned to like his reviews. He, we don't always agree, but he's definitely paying attention. Uh, uh, unlike more streamlined novels of its type, at least Huang has her settings. She depicts Silicon Valley with seductive specificity, telling tales of instant billionaires and offering glimpses of irritable geniuses changing the world. Then there's Linda, Family Trust's cranky heart, whose chapters read like them mel like melancholy short stories. I agree. Uh, Linda ascends her Tiger Lily dating app's price ladder, hopelessly hunting for a romantic match. She bumps into her ex-husband with righteous disdain and pity. She may be judgmental, impatient, and a little bitter, pondering ideas like, quote, some things in life were worth being rude for, unquote. Uh, but she's too irresistible to deny, with enough life and pain and bite to fill out a novel of her own. Oh, well, yeah, there you go. All right, we agree completely on that. Uh, good, all right. Uh, fantastic, all right. Well, we have... Uh, uh, then we have Those Who Knew. Uh, th uh, there's a profile of Those Who Knew by Ida Novi. It's not a review, but it's David Canfield again. Boy, this guy writes his head off for every issue. He works for his paycheck. Uh, and then we have The New and Notable 
just a short story collections, true stories and, uh, and thrillers, including Wendy Webb's daughter of the lake, which we saw on this channel. And then we're done. That's it. That is, uh, that is the, the latest issue of Entertainment Weekly, which was, as predicted, full of books. It's just, it starts off with a book, uh, and it goes right through. So, uh, so there you go. That was fun for me. <laughs> but I'll wrap this up. I, I, you've suffered enough. Uh, but I'll be back. Who knows? <laughs> Thank you, book